Good afternoon. My name is Paul Watkiss, and I'm here to um, kick off this high-level um, expert workshop on adaptation modeling, and it's a real pleasure to do that. And uh, we're going to start with this opening high-level plenary session. Um, as you may have guessed, our original plan was to hold this in Brussels. We've obviously moved this to a virtual workshop. Um, that has a number of advantages. It means that we've been able to extend the invitation, and so um, we have a higher number of participants. And what we're going to do is we have a series of high-level um, public access plenary sessions. We also have a number of sessions with um, adaptation modeling discussions and presentations that are also public. And we also have some uh, training sessions that you are welcome to attend as well. Uh, and complementing that, we have some um, high-level expert uh, invitation-only workshops to discuss certain issues. So that's the advantage. I think the disadvantages of moving to this uh, uh, virtual world is that things can go wrong. So we've tried to uh, take account of all the foreseen possibilities, but um, please bear with us. It may be that some things take a little bit of time to connect. Uh, it may be that some things drop in and out. But um, So what I want to do is really uh, very quickly welcome you to this workshop. Um, the workshop presents a really fantastic opportunity for a wide range of practitioners, uh, policymakers, and experts to come together uh, and to discuss uh, the evidence base on adaptation modeling and also to discuss uh, knowledge and practice and to share that. Um, the workshop involves a number of different streams. There's a little bit of work that is related to a study that uh, um, uh, has been organized and uh, this whole workshop is organized by um, DG Climate Action of the European Commission uh, and they have um, commissioned some work which will provide some support and input to the workshop which is led by the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change, CMCC, uh, working with Delteras, the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Free University of Amsterdam uh, and my organization as well. Um, and so what we have is an opportunity to uh, discuss um, adaptation modeling, um, to see where we are at the current position in time, and to look forward. And this very much is uh, helping and seeking to inform the forthcoming EU adaptation strategy revision. So we're going to hear a little bit more about that in a moment. And uh, what it is is an opportunity to take stock, but also look forward and provide the evidence base to try and help inform not just the adaptation strategy, but the actions and activities that will be in that strategy and support them going forward to upscale adaptation. Um, and I think it's worth highlighting that this is all happening at a very interesting time. Um, I always thought the 2020s would be when we started doing climate adaptation properly because of the scale of impacts. I don't think anybody really anticipated that uh, the uh, 2020s would kick off with such an unusual year. So COVID tells us some really important lessons about the power and the need for resilience. That's really clear. Um, I think it also gives us an opportunity in the post-COVID recovery, especially if that's around a green and new deal, um, to look at the synergies between mitigation and adaptation and look to see how to really scale up over the next decade as part of a new transition in Europe. That's the background. Um, what we are going to do over the next two and a half days is go through a series of sessions. We're starting off this high-level plenary session today, and what we're really focusing on is adaptation modeling. Now, I think a really important thing to stress is that adaptation is a process. So adaptation models are an input to that process. They support decision-making, they give us evidence, but they don't make decisions for us. So a lot of what we're trying to do today and over the course of the next two days is focus on how adaptation information can support the upscaling of adaptation, uh, and because of that, we're organizing this around themes of applications and end users and not just hazards. So we're really interested in the use of adaptation models to support various streams of adaptation decision making in Europe uh, and linking those going forward. So that's the context. Um, what we want to do today is start off with a high level plenary session. Um, we want to start the ball rolling with respect to uh, DG Klima's ambition in terms of getting the information and the evidence on adaptation modeling. And I want to stress that everything from this workshop will be published in a series of proceedings that will be available for everybody. So there's a real uh, input here. And as well as um, participants from the study team, we also have about 100 external invited experts who will be talking over the course of the next few days and their inputs as well will go into those high level proceedings. So this is a really unique opportunity at a really critical time 
to really push forward on adaptation and uh, using and looking at information and evidence on modeling to support that. So in this first section, we have three fantastic plenary speakers to open up uh, to give you the high level information and set the tone for the workshop. Um, they're each going to give us a short presentation of around 10 minutes, and then we'll have a couple of clarification questions. And then after the three presentations, we will have a question and answer session. And how this will work is you will be able to submit questions during the or um, through the, the chat function on your screens, and we'll collate those. We'll get some interesting groups of questions together. Uh, we may even get a few very difficult questions for our speakers to um, answer. Uh, and we'll go to a 20-minute discussion session after the plenary talks to actually have a panel session uh, and to discuss your questions and get some feedback from our panelists. And then at the very end, we are going to just uh, finish off this session with a quick question for our panelists. We want to ask them uh, to answer on either one or both of two questions. Um, the first is really around how research and innovation can support uh, adaptation policy decision making. Um, and the second is really on what the gaps are. Where do we need better knowledge and gaps to help support the new and ambitious policies uh, for adaptation that we are planning to implement in Europe? So that's my background context. What I want to do now is hand over and introduce my first speaker. Now, this may um, be a, a little bit of a technical hitch because we have to connect to a phone message and a phone line, but um, our first speaker really does uh, not need any introduction. She is Elena Visna Manowska. She's the head of DG Klima's adaptation unit, and she's got a very long and uh, 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 impressive track record in climate and environment policy. And also, I've been particularly impressed, has a very strong personal commitment to climate and environment. Um, she's an adaptation expert. She's going to tell us about the forthcoming EU adaptation strategy. Like any good adaptation expert, she's decided to reduce her uncertainty uh, by giving us a talk rather than a series of slides. Um, but the downside is because of the commission services, we have to connect to her by telephone. So what I'm hoping now is that we can switch to that telephone line. Uh, and we can ask Elena to come in and give us a presentation uh, to discuss the revised EU adaptation strategy and the challenges and priorities. So hopefully that has worked. Uh, and I probably now have to go quiet and hopefully the um, technical team can connect us to Elena to set us off on our very first high level plenary discussion uh, and presentation. Okay, this is superb and this is a really a deep adaptation also for me because after several months of working with digital tools, you can imagine the state, uh, my emotional state when I find out that there are still things to adjust and to adapt. So hello everyone, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to, to be with you and, and this is really the workshop where we want the uh, outstanding experts from research and policy to exchange knowledge and good practices on adaptation uh, modeling and actually also to strengthen your professional networks. I must say when three years back I came to uh, DG Climate Action in the European Commission, uh, we had the idea to organize the forum on uh, adaptation modeling. And, and you see it takes sometimes a little bit longer, but we still uh, manage. Now, um, let me take you through, you know, uh, why, from where are we coming in the adaptation strategy and what is the environment uh, that has changed and that pushes us to go for definitely uh, a more ambition. I mean, the, the landscape of impacts, you know it all from media. It has been yet another, you know, summer with extreme weather events, uh, flooding in Asia, drought in Europe, wildfires uh, in America. And we find ourselves in the adaptation world always talking about the storylines, about the events, about what was the past flood, what is the next fire. And we do realize that we increasingly need, in order to be credible, to be in the anticipation mode, to uh, have a, a possibility to predict 
uh, some of these impacts that are coming. And, and this is why we, we, we have set up this, uh, this uh, study and uh, this process indeed to gather as much of literature as possible. But also we see that we move from the academia world to more and more of users uh, that uh, want uh, to use uh, these uh, these uh, to assess their vulnerabilities and to actually uh, outline uh, the future of strategies. Um, let me say where we are with the European adaptation. Uh, we do get uh, a lot of recognition that adaptation is more and more known uh, to people, that it's not uh, anymore a completely uh, hidden uh, and a subject. Yet what we see uh, still is that the implementation of adaptation strategies and plans is still not perfect, be it at companies level, be it at a national level, regional. We see it not fully mainstream into um, funding, and this is really problematic. Uh, and with the recovery efforts coming our way, there will be volumes of investment going on, and they all need to be resilient so that we don't uh, build, uh, again, stranded assets, stranded now uh, with impact in mind. We see that businesses or companies are still not fully part of the adaptation efforts. You know, there are, you know, very uh, individualized activities that sometimes undermine the adaptation efforts of the others instead of a sort of structural or systemic adaptation. We see uh, uneven impacts across member states, those do, that have a technological um, capacity to deal with impacts and uh, they have deep pockets also to do so uh, against those that uh, are already reeling from uh, economic impacts of the crisis in 2008 or from a COVID crisis now. So they may be disproportionately um, affected. We see very importantly, very uneven understanding Understanding of the impacts and of uh, data and knowledge uh, available. Indeed, in some parts of Europe, uh, now difficult to say south, north, uh, west, east, but uh, it is clear that we are not yet there in a single market of knowledge for adaptation. And uh, let me also stress that the implications of uh, what it means if uh, climate risks or impacts unfold in third countries, what does it mean in, in, in Europe, actually, in, in terms of spillover effects, uh, this is not yet known. But what we see, and, and this is really, I would like to praise all the modelers, all the researchers, is that how relevant the information becomes to um, many of us, uh, be it, uh, you know, citizens, be it businesses, in our everyday decisions, uh, as, as, as you say, Paul. Um, so what we would need increasingly is indeed these reliable, sound and rapid tools for policy and decision making. A, a sort of toolbox I, I could just take out and I, I could make a, a relatively swift decision if I want to plant a new forest, if I want to buy a, a, a new house, uh, if uh, a business needs to amend its operations. Now, you have seen that adaptation has indeed received increased levels of attention, and we, of course, are, um, you know, we follow it with uh, mixed feelings because it's good that there is an increased awareness that helps preparations and minimize the cost of non action, but at the same time, it's also a sign of our collective failure to stop climate change early enough. Now, in, in European Union, the um, adaptation uh, policy has received some momentum uh, recently, mostly through the European Green Deal, uh, where uh, focus is on increased ambition for adaptation, indeed uh, announcing a new strategy uh, on climate change, and where Europe wants to demonstrate some sort of leadership and determination. There's also a sense of increased responsibility. We should go from public only responsibility and so the tragedy of commons to uh, individualized responsibility. And this is where the financial actors and businesses are uh, more and more searching for data and relevant cl uh, climate risk information. We have seen also uh, the investment volumes increasing 
uh, with recovery, we see uh, more and more uh, dedicated to uh, climate action, with uh, climate proofing of infrastructure being at the forefront, but also a lot of money going to um, research and innovation solutions. And this is indeed uh, where Philip uh, will tell you uh, much more. So what we would like to continue in the adaptation strategy is indeed uh, to uh, support much better informed decision making, stepping up definitely emphasis on data, knowledge and uh, modeling. And the working principle is the one for the proceedings of today indeed. Uh, is uh, a sort of co-creation, If is, is moving from research to innovation, from fixing uh, to preventing in, in the first place. So uh, I would like to uh, wish you uh, a very successful workshop and really looking forward to, to our exchange today. And in Thank you very much. Um, that was fantastic. It's a fantastic way to start off our um, modeling workshop. Let me see if I can also share my screen. Um, maybe I can ask you, if you're still on the line, Elena, if I can ask you one uh, perhaps point of clarification. Um, and that's just to, if you could give us an update on when the EU adaptation strategy revision um, might actually come out. Uh, and just to sort of give us a little bit more um, on the sort of steps that you're taking and, and, and uh, when that will be launched, and, and if it's possible, if there's any uh, anything that's likely to be on the table, if there's anything that you think might be really interesting that we um, might particularly want to focus in on during the next couple of days. But, um. Yeah, thanks a lot. So the timing, uh, as confirmed uh, according to our internal timetable, is the first quarter of next uh, year. And I must say, in our internal timetables, we try to be uh, as detailed as possible and in external communication as maybe blurred as possible exactly because you are committing on delivery. But uh, we hope around uh, January, February to, to have uh, the strategy ready. It all depends on internal processes because we we, uh, are being brave and we uh, are preparing also an impact assessment that will go with the strategy, something that is, uh, I would say, not often heard of in the Commission um, because we want to have a story behind what we do and we want to calibrate well some of the activities uh, that will go uh, with the strategy. So uh, this, this is also where we will be put into test uh, internally and you know the timing uh, may uh, depend on it. So what, uh, what would be uh, important for the future is definitely you know uh, bringing together more the disaster risk reduction uh, community with other Adaptation, and this is what uh, definitely Nasira will uh, will uh, talk about. And you know, to have some sort of forward-looking risk assessment, uh, you know, for Europe, so that uh, you know the different actors can see how the risk assess. Uh, I mean, how risks. Uh, may evolve uh, in time because this is also what uh, we are requesting uh, from from business players or from local authorities etc so that that's an important angle then definitely the world of finance I must say, if we want to move anything on climate risk, awareness of climate risk, we need to talk to finance uh, people. We need to talk to insurance uh, and to the incentives they have in their hands uh, to make this happen and we see uh, what, what we would like to, to have is not that we just increase the business for industry for for insurance industry to the contrary we want to have more investment into resilience uh, being promoted uh, exactly by these industry and the final point is we really need to get all these research uh, solutions uh, you know off shelves and off uh, you know um, corners uh, into uh, a use by society you know it's it's a public good uh, a lot of these tools uh, are being developed uh, as as public good uh, so um, we as citizens as businesses uh, as users um, can uh, honestly can pr provide a market uh, for for all those tools so th that would be let's say that the three priority areas i would say thank you Thank you very much. Um, just a word for our participants. What you can start to do now is there should be a chat box that you can see on your screens. And you can start putting in questions now, even for the talk that we've just had, 
and we'll start collating those um, ready to when we get to the session at the end for questions and answers. So um, hopefully you should be able to start putting those into the chat box as they come to mind. And please add those as well as we go on to our next talk. Okay, um, thank you very much, Elena. I cannot see any other points of clarification. Um, that was enormously helpful and I think that really sets the scene. So I think we are talking about um, a different adaptation environment and landscape to where we were when the last adaptation strategy came out, which uh, was quite a few years ago now. And January and February does sound quite ambitious. I have to admit, I've lost track of time. Um, I've just remembered that it is actually September. So that's not so long away. So I guess you have a very uh, intense period now of um, policy work to get through and to launch to that. Uh, but um, I think it's uh, it's great that we're having this workshop today um, and over the next course of the two days to provide some um, additional information that may be of use, especially for the sort of storyline that you mentioned. Okay, what I would like to do now is um, ask if we can go to our second talker. So our second speaker is Nasira Buluhat from uh, um, DG Echo, and she is head of the Prevention and Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, DG Echo is the DG for European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations. Great, that looks promising. Um, and she's a real expert on resilient societies and on foreign policy, on civil emergencies, and on all sorts of things that can go wrong. Uh, so what we're gonna hopefully hear is how things can go right. And Nasir is gonna give us a talk about um, the emerging uh, issues around civil protection and national risk assessments, uh, and really making that link that Elena has mentioned about linking disaster risk reduction with climate change adaptation. Um, thank you, and over to you. Uh, thank you. I will uh, thank you for giving me the floor and thank you for the invitation uh, to this conference. Uh, I'm very happy to, to speak on, on behalf of DG Echo uh, precisely because we're doing a lot of work together with, uh, with the team of Elena, linking up my job, uh, our job in Echo and on disaster risk reduction and on climate adaptation. I've got a few slides uh, to share with you. I will be talking for about 10 minutes on, on, on uh, disaster risks in the EU um, in the sense that in the Commission we collect on a regular basis uh, analysis of risks, uh, disastrous risks from the EU member states and, and six other countries which are participating in the European Union civic protection mechanism. So. Uh, by legislation, actually, there is an exercise whereby member states assess uh, their risks uh, at national or subnational level. And on the basis of these submissions, we do also in the Commission, with the different services of the Commission, from Clima to Agriculture, Environment, Eco, etc uh, provide uh, an analysis uh, from 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 an eu and commission perspective so that's uh, this exercise uh, we carry every three years basically for member states and for the commission and uh, the next edition of this report that we are going to release uh, in the commission is coming soon. Uh, we are really at the last phases uh, of the publication, but I will give you here uh, the key uh, findings and what we have learned, not only in the national reporting of the member states in terms of disaster risks, but also what we have learned in terms of how we do that and what are the trends, what are the drivers, and what is, uh, if I may say, the direction of travel. So, uh, uh, I don't want to bore you with all the dates, but just for you to know that soon uh, for this audience, I think it would be interesting to see uh, how uh, what came out from national risk assessments and our own analysis. Um, what we see clearly, uh, this is now the third time, the third exercise we do is that there is uh, an evolution in terms of the risk landscape and an evolution as to how national authorities are, are analyzing and reporting on, on it. A positive evolution in terms of the work that's done on risk assessment, uh, but let, let, we will come to the details on the risks themselves. So 
uh, I think of interest to the conversation today. Uh, this slide is, is not maybe, uh, it illustrates uh, the risks that are most commonly reported and addressed by member states in their national risk assessments. And you would see that because this conversation is about climate adaptation, uh, flooding, extreme weather and wildfires, and earthquake, well, no, not earthquake, but drought, uh, really feature as, 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 you know, the top 10 risks. Uh, it, they are in the top 10 risks and, and they are taken quite seriously in national reporting. There are many other risks and, and, and I will not really speak about them, uh, the security related and the man-made risks, but here again, a confirmation that climate related risks are serious uh, and they are also uh, uh, addressed in national risk assessments in, uh, in a wide fashion. Now, the next slide is uh, as part of the analysis that we are doing, uh, we're trying to see uh, how uh, the analysis uh, of the impact and likelihood of risks is, is conducted. Um, it's interesting to see that heat waves and epidemics are considered by member states uh, as category of risks uh, for which there is a high likelihood uh, of, of happening, but also a high impact. Uh, and the result of this is that these are really considered and addressed in national risk assessment. You, you may say, yes, not to the extent that we want, but at least they are considered. There's this other category of risks uh, where you have a low likelihood and high impact, there it's more difficult to trigger public policies to invest in those uh, such as uh, nuclear disaster. But, but, but here, uh, well, the good news is that heat waves are, are still considered like high likelihood and high impact. And it probably explains why member states have discussed those for instance in length. My next slide uh, is about uh, the trends uh, that we, we have observed over the last three years reporting perspective, but also I would say, if I may, over three rounds of doing this exercise of collecting and analyzing national risk assessments. In the short term, uh, the trends are fairly stable, uh, but Virtually all the member states tell us that the outlook for the future is negative. It's not so breaking news to you. Uh, but the second observation, uh, and if we put it there in the slide, it's because it's now embedded in most of the national risk assessment, I think it's 20 of them, and that, that's a good score, is that climate change is recognized as a key driver for risks across all member states. Now, what we miss a bit in, in the national uh, risk assessments is, is the use of, of, clim of projections for climate related risks. Uh, definitely, definitely for most of the countries, uh, uh, drought, uh, flooding and extreme weather uh, have received uh, much higher attention than before. Heat waves, and epidemics uh, and, and saying epidemics, it's a big concern. And, and those reports that I'm talking about was, was written, were written even before COVID. So for us, it's quite interesting. And what we have noticed also uh, uh, for the reasons you all know is that there were much more in-depth reflection on forest fires uh, with all its dimension, including the climate change uh, 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 reasoning before, uh, behind uh, an escalation of, of forest fires uh, in many regions of Europe and beyond. So, so we think that in terms of uh, the evolution of risk understanding uh, uh, within the member states, these are quite positive news. Uh, even though I would say that the depth of understandings when it comes, for instance, 
the link between the risks and climate and adaptation. It, this needs a bit more work, uh, um, and, and, and the member states should discuss a bit more. In our view, uh, what to be ready for and when, and, 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 and the likelihood and, and, the, and the adaptation. Now, uh, I, I also, uh, we also noted that uh, flooding is, is also, uh, the way member states uh, uh, report on flooding has changed a bit. So it's not only about uh, fluvial uh, floods, uh, coastal and, and, and fluvial flood are, are, are also very much reported and flash floods uh, as, 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 as a growing and new phenomenon. And we're quite happy that this is taken into consideration uh, because it is uh, it is a growing issue. Uh, I say did extreme weather uh, that's uh, even categorized by some member states as, as one of the top uh, risks and concerns. Um, and we didn't have that in the previous national risk assessment. I could even say that heat waves uh, are seen by member states as, as the most dangerous events in terms of, of human impact. So what I'm saying here, please, uh, let's put this into context. Um, this is what member states report and say in their analysis. Uh, so so, so, so uh, this is what uh, you should, we're not saying that, you know, this is uh, what, what, what science or, or, or what the evidence is, but definitely it's interesting to, to hear to how member states self-assess the situation of, of their risks and the drivers and the trends. Um, sorry, uh, I think I should move to... Yeah, the next, oh, sorry, the next slide, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because it was about the other risks, those which are not, uh, you know, triggered by natural hazards. So man-made uh, uh, disasters, uh, sorry. So here, I think one sentence on this uh, in the interest of time is that where there's many uh, discussion about the drivers for man-made man-made risks like security, terrorism, hybrid threats, etc. Uh, drivers around uh, geopolitical considerations, technological, demographic, but sometimes climate change. It may be less obvious uh, for us in Europe, but uh, uh, definitely for the work we are doing also with the Geoclima on, 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 on security, uh, climate, uh, climate change, and, 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 and demography, and, and, and movements of population and displacement, it's absolutely critical. Uh, but we read some of that in the national risk assessment, so, so this is what I would focus on for this audience today. Now, in terms of a few words about where we are going and what's the outlook, I think this time, um, we uh, we wanted to give more uh, consideration uh, in uh, in reporting and analyzing risks uh, to uh, to the economic costs of all of that of disasters and, and I think we are together in this business. Uh, with DG Clima and DG Echo and many other services of the Commission now who have also economic finance. Um, we think that there is uh, a need to be reporting a bit more on that because it's really important for policy making. And uh, needless to say, uh, the damage caused by, by, by disasters is, is, is continuously increasing. And, and challenging national and European response. Uh, we have data, but we're working together uh, with Elena, her team, and others uh, because we need more than that. Uh, we need we need to make some improvements. I'm sort of anticipating on your next question, actually. All right. What we have learned also uh, uh, from 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 the impact of, of disasters it's that, is that heat waves are the biggest killer in Europe. I think I said it already. already. Uh, the disasters which are really costly, which have a high financial impact, 
uh, as they are now are storms, uh, flooding and earthquake. And uh, what we have, I think I wanted to, 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 to share with you also something which is of a, a concern to all of us in the commission, but not only is, is the data limitations. This continues to be an issue. There is data, there is information, but there are gaps. And, and uh, uh, we think that we know more certain certain types of impacts and certain types of risks, but others are less documented. Uh, we have less evidence. Uh, we have really uh, 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 the problem of data on losses, and, and we continue to be working together. Uh, with Klima and others on this, we want to to move on that. And, and uh, uh, past losses cannot be the only indication uh, for uh, policy making. Uh, we need to, to to look also at the future. So all of that, uh, with a lot of humility, we recognize that there are gaps and weaknesses, and, and that we we just have to work on it. Uh, this is uh, why we are uh, there for. Um, so, in terms of, of the future, we'd like to, to, to take a closer look at the risk drivers. Uh, and this is where we want this work to be going. Uh, certainly, there is uh, uh, the driver of climate change and, and uh, you know, certainly about the research conducted uh, with the GRC Clima. Uh, look further into the uh, challenges of urbanization environmental degradation, uh, the security part, again, maybe it's less for this conversation and, and, and the, the, the technological development. But certainly for here, uh, climate change is, is, is on top of where we want uh, this exercise of understanding and analyzing risks uh, uh, improve. And you said it when we started uh, this conversation, I think, Paul, or with, I mean, adaptation is a process, understanding the risks, uh, especially or including those which are triggered or impacted by climate. Uh, it's also a process. So we, we have to adapt, we have to adjust the way we analyze, the way we uh, do the risk assessment, and the way we move forward. Uh, Monsieur, would you I be able to finish in the next two or three minutes? Is that okay? Sorry, to, sorry, two, sorry or three, two, two, two or three minutes more, perhaps? I am, I, am, I am nearly at the end. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Yes, yes. yes. So, so uh, I'm nearly at the end. Uh, just to say that uh, everything that said before, I said before uh, 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 shows that there is progress in the methodological part of risk assessment but uh, there are efforts uh, to be made when it comes to climate change i said it the cross-border dimension uh, you know no risks uh, stops at the border stop at the border the comparability of the data we get uh, and then uh, uh, the exposure and vulnerability the damage assessment so this is in a, in a nutshell uh, what works and what needs to work better uh, in, in our in the way we see it. Uh, the cross-border dimension, interdependency, uh, this is really something we're going to be working, uh, we, we will be working on. And um, we have a proposal to revise the legislation and work on on, on resilience goals and, and look at what are the uh, goals that we can set for ourselves uh, in order to uh, ensure the resilience of societal functions uh, in the union. And that's triggered more by the COVID uh, sanitary crisis, but other type of risks can also uh, uh, require this kind of thinking. Voila. So my last uh, uh, slide in the form of a summary is that uh, we consider that uh, uh, the implication for disaster risk assessment and management risks uh, risk is, a, is 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 by definition dynamic so so we need to adapt and look at the past and the future um, 
they are complex and this is where we should be looking at cross-border and cross-sectoral impact, what I said uh, just now. Uh, and then uh, uh, the resilience of critical infrastructure across the EU uh, is going to, to be uh, at the center of, of uh, in our agenda and, and there are some proposals by the Commission to be working on that, on the critical infrastructure framework. Um, and then that we need to strengthen our collective capacity as EU for large scale disaster scenario. We made a proposal as ECHO civic protection uh, in this regard, so it's under negotiation. So I cannot say more uh, on this at this stage, but it's really part of the proposals we are making. Uh, maybe more uh, progress of work to be done on financial risk management, so the economic and financial part of it, and, and then uh, link everything that we are trying to do here to the strategic investment. We don't have time, but there's many funds and instruments across the Commission uh, that can support uh, this adaptation and this work on disaster risk management. Uh, Elena and, and myself, uh, uh, are, are, are tracking all these instruments to make sure that the right investments are, are made and and and, uh, and we have that in our uh, uh, as part of our uh, almost daily job. So this is also uh, uh, this would be my last word for today. So I'm I'm, I'm really happy to to take your questions and. Uh, and keep the discussion going. Thank you for your attention. Thank you ever so much. That was extraordinarily useful and uh, also really picked up from the points that Elena was mentioning as well. Um, because we're, um, we want to make sure we give enough time for uh, our final speaker, what we'll do is we'll um, hold the questions to the end. Um, what I'd like to do now is invite our third speaker to connect. And our third speaker is Philippe Tulkens, who's from European Commission and from RTD. And uh, I think Philip actually started life as a life sci as a, a climate scientist and, and has a long history of working on climate policy and support. So he, as I understand it, is currently deputy head of the unit in uh, research and innovation on climate and planetary boundaries. And he's gonna talk to us about one of the most interesting initiatives that's come out of the commission in recent years in terms of um, the mission area on adaptation to climate change and societal transformation, uh, which is, um, I think hoping to deliver everything that Elena and uh, Nasira have been talking about um, with a, a real scale up and demonstration at the European level. So uh, with a bit of luck, uh, Philippe, can you join us now? Is that uh, you connected? Yes, here and share my webcam. So now you should see that I'm uh, in an empty house because I'm, uh, I'll be moving soon. Um, do you see my uh, slides? Yes, we do. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Uh, because I, uh, it, it's funny, you have three um, presentations from commission officials in a row and we had to use our private device to connect because uh, the security of the IT system does not, does not allow um, uh, go to webinar to function properly. So we all struggle, but we found a solution. That's what uh, Elena described as uh, extreme adaptation. Uh, we, we can do that. And I will pick up on what, what she said to start my, my presentation. Uh, she insisted on making things happen on, on, on the ground. And um, this is uh, exactly what also um, the research part of the commission realized is that the clock is ticking. Uh, mitigation is, uh, of climate change is progressing, but needs to accelerate tremendously. And with regard to adaptation, we know that the da damages are already being felt. They will increase and uh, society is not sufficiently prepared overall. And solutions are there, but it takes too much time to bring the solutions that have been developed through research and innovation uh, on the ground to test them, to demonstrate, and then to deploy them beyond. Within the research program, what we can do is up to go up to the, uh, I would say, pilot demonstration, uh, uh, pilot deployment phase. We cannot be, go beyond. And what we try to do 
um, in, in Horizon Europe is to really strengthen this part of the research and innovation activities uh, through different ways. Of course, we will continue to fund massively a research and innovation on climate, on adaptation, on mitigation, and all relevant aspects to develop the knowledge uh, that is uh, extremely important. But on top of that, we need to do more. We need to go beyond research. And that's why the missions, the concept of missions have been introduced. Uh, Professor Mazzucato uh, uh, developed the concept proposed it to the Commission. She published some reports. I'm sure some of you have uh, had the opportunity to read those reports. And now the Commission is trying to uh, uh, implement this idea, but to develop the, the content of the different missions, they uh, rely on expert groups, uh, expert groups uh, constituted in uh, mission boards. So there is a mission board on climate change, uh, in, in, on adaptation to climate change, including societal transformation. And we have the pleasure uh, to have uh, Jaroslav Miziak as uh, one of the key members of this board. He has worked uh, tireless on, on the development of the scoping of uh, this mission, and he will continue to work uh, with the, the board that is chaired by Connie Eregard. She is well known in the climate community, of course, and, and uh, the work is progressing. The commission will then take the advice of this board that will be uh, handed over to a set of commissioners on the 22nd of September in a conference called the RNI Days uh, that will happen online, and I invite you to register if you wish to attend. There will be a session for the handover of the, the mission scoping document, but there will be also another session to discuss uh, the mission itself. Uh, it's open. You're most welcome to register. And uh, now I stop with the publicity and continue on the, on the content uh, to uh, describe what this mission uh, uh, may contain. At this stage, uh, I repeat, we are at the stage of elaborating the um, uh, scoping of, of the mission. Sorry, I think I, it removed, yes. And um, the vision overall is really about accelerating the transformation uh, and, and to prepare ourselves to uh, climate prepare and resilient Europe. I think it's quite straightforward. We want to turn the urgent challenge of adapting to climate change into an opportunity to make Europe more climate prepared, resilient, and just. But of course, we cannot do that in the whole of Europe at once. Uh, this is not possible. The, the mission intends to test solution, to demonstrate on the ground in local area for the different type of climate risks and to see what works and what is more difficult, what requires more knowledge, what requires better technologies. We are also exploring non-technological solutions and uh, the the, the uh, beauty and, and the, the uh, chance that we have in the mission is that we can fail. In the adaptation strategy, when we deploy solutions, we can't fail because public money used be, needs to be used the best way possible. But here in research, it is authorized to fail in, in some cases. And you all know that research is often about failing to learn. And that's how we learn. And to, to have this opportunity to have these big experiments on the ground is, is, uh, is unique, new. And I think the Europe uh, will be leading in, in, the, in this area. There are three types of uh, objectives. Uh, one is mostly for um, uh, the whole of, of uh, Europe. And sorry, here I, no, 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 no. Sorry, I have a little hiccup with, because uh, to, to uh, the bottom of this pyramid uh, is really to work on the, uh, data, the information, the awareness, the understanding, and to prepare uh, European citizens to uh, manage climate risks, such as uh, the risk we have uh, heard about in the previous uh, presentation. This is for all Europeans, and you researchers, uh, modelers, will be uh, strongly uh, uh, invited to uh, contribute to these um, uh, activities through calls in uh, the research and innovation program, but not only there, because this is uh, part of the uh, mission concept, is it is rooted in research and innovation, but it will go beyond and mobilize other funding instruments of the EU, of the member states, and at local level to uh, bring 
uh, more activities in the field going beyond strictly the uh, strengthening of the knowledge. Then the goal is to have uh, to accelerate the transition to a, a climate resilient future in 200 communities in, 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 in regions. Uh, we want to help those in designing a vision and innovative pathways and developing enabling conditions and solution. And then we'll also, with a more reduced number of uh, entities, communities and regions, we want to build resilience and really scale up solution, go for deep demonstration with about in about 100 demonstrators. This is what the board uh, uh, will propose uh, to the commission and the commission will reflect on uh, what it can implement and how to implement and will continue to work of course with the board on that. So uh, I would say that the, the, the mission will be an important instrument to reach uh, the aims outlined in the EU strategy for climate change adaptation that we heard uh, about in the previous presentations. Uh, together with our colleagues from DG Klima, also with DG ECO, uh, we have worked to closely align the different policy instruments and the, they are really mutually reinforcing. So they, they, we should not uh, think that th these are two parallel initiatives. These are really coordinated policy activities, one on really the broad uh, adaptation strategy and the other one on testing solutions locally in a, in a number of, of regions and very closely with the actors. In terms of uh, approach, um, we have, we, we, we understand that we, there are three fundamental and interrelated dimension that will guide the mission. One is the resilient to, uh, of environmental systems with a commitment to long-term sustainability, the precaution, precautionary and the do not harm principle. Uh, I, those who are familiar with the Green Deal uh, have also seen that the do not harm principle uh, has been included in, in, in the Green Deal and it's a very important dimension because one of the difficulty in policy making is making sure that the policy is not harming, uh, that one policy is not harming uh, another one. Uh, the resilience of social and economic system is uh, the second dimension with a commitment to equity, social and gender justice, attention to children and youth and to leave no one behind. So this social dimension is very important. It, it cannot be forgotten. And also uh, it gives me the opportunity to stress that in the research and innovation activities, um, uh, contrary to an old uh, reputation of uh, the European programs, we don't focus only on technology. Uh, we focus also uh, on um, the knowledge on non-technological solutions, but also on socioeconomic and social aspects that are fully integrated in the thinking and should be integrated in all your projects you will, you will be participating to. The third dimension is the resilience of political systems uh, we, we, with a commitment to inclusiveness, deliberation, shared values, solidarity and respect for diversity. And in terms of deliberation, uh, the mission has already uh, tested uh, uh, citizen engagement events that have been uh, quite successful to get feedback on the in an interim report from the board uh, on the scoping of this mission and uh, citizens tend to be enthusiastic uh, about uh, what the commission is is, is proposing uh, as an activity and we 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 we, we can't disappoint them uh, we'll have to come with concrete activities that change uh, their life uh, and the life of the people in the areas that will be covered by, by the mission. So the mission aims to um, put in, in, in action three principles through co-design, co-implementation and co-evaluation. And those are not just the uh, buzzword uh, thrown like that so that they look nice. It's really meant and the work of the board has uh, integrated this notion uh, very deeply and I encourage you to uh, read the document, the scoping document of the mission. An interim report is available currently uh, on the web, but on the 22nd of September, the final document on the scoping of the mission will be available to all and we'll be very happy to receive your, your feedback on uh, the content of this document, because I'm sure that you will see that there are opportunities for you. In, part, in particular, the modeling teams uh, can be extremely uh, helpful to design um, uh, scenarios uh, in the implementation phase because the, um, 
uh, I've seen in the list of participants that there are several teams quite specialized uh, on, on some of the system that are at risk that are that are at risk under climate change, and those teams could uh, be of great help to uh, um, inform on the feasibility of some of the uh, activities of the mission, also on the cost, the cost dimension being also fundamental. Uh, as you say that uh, in the introduction that I'm a former climate uh, scientist, yes, I'm a, a former climate modeler, and I, I would like to take here uh, 30 seconds to uh, also um, recall a message that is important, is that in developing modeling, uh, it, it's very important now to evolve also in the approach. Uh, the modeling now needs to be open uh, and, and, and the codes and the data available. Uh, I know that some may be shocked by that because there is a, a lot of consultancy going on uh, in, in the area, but uh, I strongly believe, and there is a policy on that, on open, uh, open access not only to publication but also to data and tools, uh, that the science can progress only if it's done in a transparent way. Uh, and uh, for consultants, there, is, there are business models uh, that are uh, really fully viable while uh, using open models. Uh, maybe this will have the opportunity to discuss later on in the uh, uh, other uh, workshop part of, of, of this event. But this is an important dimension since I'm speaking to modelers to integrate. I've worked before on energy modeling in the context of climate policies, and the same issue is uh, appears. And uh, to politicians, when the models are closed, when they are black box, it raises more questions than provide answer. I saw in the chat early on, earlier on that projections are not sufficiently used, and one of the reasons for that is sometimes the lack of transparency. Um, I don't want to open another new debate here, but within my presentation, I wanted to stress that point that I see important. Going back now to uh, the uh, um, the mission itself, it will the governance mechanism uh, will be built on existing structure because if we uh, create new structures. First, it will not appear uh, to the people as the right response to the challenge, and it will take too much too much time, and we need to deploy fast uh, this mission. So we'll bid on existing structure, and we'll try to be agile, allowing for adjustment to specific circumstances in regions and communities, and to promote efficient efficiency, reflectivity, democratic deliberation, as I said before, and accountability. And this includes. Uh, local governance platforms, support ac across multiple levels of governance, and uh, the mission will have to organize communities of practice around key areas of innovation. So that those are huge challenges to mobilize the regions, the communities, and new researchers are uh, really uh, more than welcome, of course, in these activities. There will be opportunities, but also to spread the message around. We are only starting to uh, inform about uh, the missions. Uh, what we need there is to attract those who are motivated to uh, test solution, who can bring also perhaps some of their funding to the activities, um, because the fragmentation of funding is not helpful to have a, a meaningful uh, impact. Um, that's for the support, support structure. In terms of uh, areas of uh, innovation, um, I would say that the mission will mobilize research and innovation, as I say, to improve and uh, fill knowledge gaps at regional and local level and unlock the benefits um, of the digital transformation for and within the regions and communities. It is particularly important to be able to predict the physical climate risk at the local level and to model social and economic impacts. But here I need to stress that the mission will not uh, start initiate activities that will have an answer in five years or, or from now. That is too late. We need to use uh, in practice current knowledge uh, on the ground and then at the same time in parallel further develop this knowledge. So it needs to be done through parallel track and not sequential tracks only. Otherwise, it won't make a difference in times. The partner regions and the communities will be assisted in scenario building and modeling, and you, the modelers, of course, will be instrumental in this. 
uh, and um, to develop context-specific adaptation pathways and visualizing possible future. I'm sure much of this information already exists, but it's not sufficiently disseminated. Uh, when we meet a local representative, the most frequent questions that we get is, what can I do? Uh, where can I find information of what is happening in my local constituency? Uh, every everyone would like to see uh, on on Google uh, on Google Earth uh, a projection of the future of his or her uh, property. Uh, that is a natural reflex that people have, and sometimes it's challenging to show. It exists in some countries, it exists in some regions, but still it can be very much developed. And I think that if those visualization tool are indeed de developed, it will help in mobilizing the people to strengthen the research. Often when I'm in touch with researchers, they said, oh, but this visualization, this dissemination is not really your priority. We want to develop the knowledge, but they fail to understand that to get more support, more funding uh, for the research activity themselves, they need to show that research then can deliver the solutions that the people need. And uh, so the mission will facilitate the co-production of data and knowledge and uh, the co-design for climate services and solution with citizens and stakeholders to improve the local relevance of data, usability of digital services in an open way and, and practicability of solutions. And uh, here is my final slide with, uh, of course, the key information is who are the authors of the uh, report. Um, uh, I think that Yaroslav could, uh, maybe should have uh, given this presentation. Uh, I, I gave it for the commission, but actually we received information for them. We develop it with them as well because we, we run the secretariat of uh, the mission board. And I'm really pleased with this cooperation. We learn so much from the experts uh, and I hope that they also learn from the, the exchange with the administration to be close to what happens uh, in, to, uh, in the policy making world. Thank you, and I'm open to uh, reply to questions. Thank you ever so much. That's uh, extremely useful again, and uh, uh, that's really uh, set out the vision on this adaptation mission. Now, what I think we're going to do now is we have um, a good session now uh, where we can ask some questions. What I'd like to do, um, Philippe, if you can stay on the line, I'm not sure if Nasira, you are also able to come online, and Elena? Are you able to both join us as well? And we can start going through some of the questions. Sure. Okay. Uh, Elena, are you there as well? I'm just checking. Yes, I'm in. Okay, well, you're in. You can have the first question then. Um, right, so I think our um, first question was really for Elena on her presentation. And it was a question around um, the consultation that you've been going through as part of the development of the new EU strategy. And, and really to get any sense you have of the feedback on the strategy and particularly the public feedback. I think that's the question that was really of interest. Mm -hmm. What's the public feedback? And, and also to see if that feedback's changed, particularly from the previous strategy or even over the last three years. All right. Uh, you caught me a little bit unprepared here, Paul, because the deadline for the public consultation was on 20th of August. And uh, what I know is that 80% uh, of replies come really from, from citizens, which shows that there is a, an interest on climate adaptation, that uh, the fact we need to adapt, adjust to uh, something that strikes becomes uh, more, uh, you know, uh, part of our living rooms or uh, of our everyday life, etc. So I would say this is positive as opposed to uh, consultations uh, in, in previous years where we would have more interest on the corporate side, uh, corporate, I mean, academia or, uh, you know, uh, different networks, etc. So uh, I would say this, this is really important. What we have to still look for, I, I think what we have received as feedback are mostly the climate adaptation enthusiasts or those who really press for more ambition, but we need to scratch a little bit at the surface of, of the uh, public consultation to see where the resistance comes from. Uh, and uh, this this is what, uh, at, at this point in time, uh, I have no, uh, I have no clue. Uh, 
to be uh, very honest <laughs> with uh, with all of you. But if uh, there is uh, my colleague uh, Livio uh, in the present in proceedings in the coming days, uh, uh, he would be uh, well prepared to uh, you know to respond to that. So in a summary, much more uh, public concerned about climate impacts. Uh, but still rather on the on the side of the concern of, of the converted maybe community uh, than uh, the one uh, that, uh, you know, we seek also to address the sort of non-activist middle or, you know, those that, uh, that make uh, the, the big uh, decisions. That's fantastic. Really interesting as well that you've got so many from citizens. Um, Elena, just to, to, to give you some notice, I'll come around and ask you the questions that we have at the start after we've been through one round with everybody else. So the, the question about uh, research and innovation supporting policy and knowledge needs and gaps, I'll give you a, a couple of minutes uh, warning that I'll come back to you in a second and ask those questions. Um, if I can ask Nasira, we've had a lot of questions. I have to be just um, random almost in selecting them, but one that I think is very important and also very interesting and where I see a really strong linkage with climate change uh, is someone has asked if we are, uh, as part of your um, risk assessments, you're also looking outside of Europe uh, in terms of um, you know, disaster risks from climate and also changing climate change uh, uh, effects on extreme risks itself. So whether there's a, a shift in emphasis to look globally and look at how effects and risks outside Europe can actually cascade into Europe. Uh, and uh, it's an open question in terms of whether that's starting to become more of an issue. Or, or, or whether it's something that you start to see that being a greater focus for the future, perhaps? For the time being, uh, this, this part of, of looking at risks uh, uh, addresses uh, the countries of the European Union uh, because we, we have a legal base and a framework to be requesting for that and to be working on that. But uh, of course, uh, nothing uh, stops at the boundaries of the EU. And you asked me the question where I sit in a service uh, where we look after uh, issues around risks and, and, and risk management in the European Union, but also it's echoed. So, so definitely my, uh, my answer is yes, uh, we uh, uh, examine and look at the risks uh, outside the union and in particular for all the countries that the commission is serving in all, in order to help other countries and communities uh, uh, cater for 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 disasters and and, um, and crisis so the only thing is that we don't have the same uh, level of depth and and and, and analysis and reach uh, precisely because for for our own member states and for Europe, we have methodologies, we have systems, and we have funding. And for third countries, it's 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 a different way of, of doing things. But there, I can reassure you that uh, as part of uh, working more on on building resilience and disaster preparedness for for humanitarian countries, if I may say, or or, or communities affected by humanitarian disasters, where ECHO has to provide support there. It's the same. The mantra is analyze your risks, integrate um, the climate considerations and other vulnerabilities and conflicts. And, and, and when we do that in parallel, but uh, it would be wrong if I said we have exactly the same needs. And we want to do more preparedness, risk understanding, uh, and, 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 and also uh, early warning and this kind of things in, in, in third countries. So, so that's part of the mandate also. I hope this answers your question. Yes, that's very interesting. Now, I have a question for Philippe. Uh, we seem to have a lot of questions about co-design, cooperative design. So that's um, what the questions are, are around. And I think um, there's a set of questions just to get a better um, understanding of how you're doing co-design, particularly with communities or even the general public, um, because that's a, uh, um, I think, just trying to understand how that might work and, and, and um, also going forward as part of your um, your planned mission, how that might be taken forward in the future. So it's a co-design question for you. Yeah, 
so uh, the co-design will have uh, several phases. For the moment, uh, uh, while preparing the scoping document, the board has consulted. Uh, they have consulted uh, citizens through the citizen engagement, uh, and also uh, stakeholders have uh, contacted, uh, have submitted uh, positions, uh, papers, and suggestions. Uh, when we'll enter in the next phase, uh, the uh, reflection on the implementation, this is where the co-design will be most uh, important. Uh, it's clear that there is such the diversity of climate risks and uh, in the uh, Europe's geography is, is, is big. It doesn't make sense to uh, define a priori the risks that will be addressed in the mission, but uh, we need to go to the local regions, to the communities and ask them, okay, what are the key risks that you uh, are aware of, that you identified, that you want to tackle through this mission? And, and, and to which we could co-design with you some uh, activities. So it will require indeed a, a scheme to first identify the partners, the regions, the communities, and to have a structured dialogue and to define uh, a plan uh, for, for the activities. Uh, this is currently uh, in the uh, reflection phase in the board and uh, within the commission um, and, and the scoping document that will come out on the 22nd of December uh, will not uh, define yet how it will happen in, in place but it will define what the mission will do. Uh, so, so I don't want to raise expectations there yet but of course when this first phase will have been uh, completed and we see that there is enough support, we'll reach out to regions, to communities, uh, to, to, to find partners. And some already contacted the Commission. Some uh, areas, some regions already said, we are interested in the mission. We would like to be amongst the pilot. And we already have some activities. We want to showcase uh, uh, what we can do. And we want also to show to others uh, our capabilities in the field. So um, uh, I think the key will be in defining a good method to engage these dialogue for the, 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 the co-design and to manage to have the flexibility uh, in the scheme to be able to really address the local needs and only that, and not to see solutions that would uh, be, uh, certainly no solution would be imposed to everyone. With regard to the bottom part of the pyramid, just one information, this is really for uh, all Europeans and the, the need to disseminate better the current knowledge uh, is, is, is fundamental. And I hope that this conference will be an opportunity to reflect on that, on how to do that with the researchers, because in our preparatory work, that's really one of the weakness that we found. Sometimes the gaps actually are, are filled, but it's just not known. Uh, so how can we access this and how can we make sure that the information reaches the users that need it? Thank you ever so much. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, just go around the panel and ask them the, pre, pre, the, uh, the sort of key questions that we had. And then what we can do is we can come back and see if we can persuade our panelists to stay on for another five or ten minutes and take a few further questions afterwards. So, um, Elena, if I can come back to you with those headline questions that we'd asked and feel free to answer one or the other. Um, I think what we're interested in, both in terms of the questions and also uh, the workshop and going forward, is how research and innovation can best support policy and decision making on adaptation or um, you know, how specific or what the specific knowledge needs and gaps are that are most important for supporting you in uh, developing European policy. So I, I didn't know if there was uh, anything that you wanted to respond to on mm -hmm. those high-level questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Paul, for, for those questions. I, I think we, we are saying this all the time as a policy, uh, let's say, uh, agents in, in, in the Commission that we really need to link research and innovation uh, closely to policy objectives. And, uh, you know, what we often see that there is an important time lag between um, a sort of stated uh, research uh, subject um, and uh, the policy objective. And I, I think we could, uh, by, uh, you know, stating an urgency on, on a policy, 
roll out much uh, more aggressively even the the research uh, solutions uh, so far we have been very much into linearity you know uh, research is uh, you know doing something and then policy takes over so for me the co-creation is indeed also to create in research a safe space for, for policy to experiment if, if you want uh, to say this, to set aside some of the, uh, let's say, real barriers in, in real policy world and, and, and try to, to uh, find a solution. At the same time, I must say, I, I wouldn't like research just to, you know, um, be uh, submissive to policy, but also to challenge policy, you know, to uh, increasingly improve uh, policy or legislation. I've, I've dealt with infringement policies of um, environmental uh, legislation and uh, one of my frustrations was that I realized how much the environmental legislation is actually lagging behind the technological progress. So we have been often legislating on a state uh, cementing uh, the, the, the state of the environment like 10, 20 years ago. So there a research, a, a sort of assertive research and innovation uh, could uh, solve that uh, as, as a sort of like companion or sometimes even a, a sort of, uh, you know, replacement being a, um, being a way how we do legislation or how, uh, how we do policy. And I, I think in climate adaptation, it's even uh, more, um, let's say, it, it, it does apply uh, even more because indeed we, we often talk about something that is uh, long term, slowly uh, changing, but, but I think we are heading into uh, disruptions uh, whose scale is, is for the time being unimaginable. And I, I don't think we can uh, deal with it uh, with a policy or with a legislation, but we really need to deploy a, a strong research and innovation arm there. Over. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn to Nasira and ask the same two questions. And again, you can answer one or both. Um, the first question is really how research and innovation can support policy and uh, decision making and I think particularly on that space between disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation or if you want you can talk about um, where you think the knowledge gaps are for you uh, in terms of what's the most important areas that we need to address to um, support European Commission policy in this area of both disaster risk reduction and, uh, and climate change adaptation. All right. Uh uh, thank you. On, on research and, and innovation, uh, and I mean, I want to thank you for this question because uh, it's 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 part of the uh, uh, reflections that we are doing in this co-creation environment uh, with DGRTD uh, ourselves, and also with DigiClima, and and we on a regular basis provide for the type of priority that we need to see uh, as DG Echo. I think we've we promoted uh, the, the the call on, on Green Deal and, and asked for investments and, and in research and innovation on on, uh, on wildfires and also uh, and also climate adaptation and for us it was a strong point for the good reason that that uh, civic protection has been uh, called too often actually to 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 respond to to wildfires and, and and this kind of disasters but it's not only it's not our only uh area where we think that there should be investment there's also all all the clusters on 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 on, on security and the resilience of societies uh, when it comes to critical infrastructure uh societal assets etc so there definitely we need you know we need to be doing more I, th I think uh, I, I think uh, uh, perhaps in terms of specific knowledge and gaps, uh, uh, like the lessons learned we learned from from the sanitary crisis is 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 you know the resilience of EU and the capacity to react has been tested and it's also valid for other disasters and for other. Uh, risks and, and, and for climate also related risks. So 
we've got to to take actually our thinking uh, to, to to the next level, which is you know there is a risk, there are cascading effects, there are cross sectoral impact that we have not seen and we have not predicted, and maybe now we have to to take it to another level. So so that's why I I, I think. Uh, uh, thinking in terms of uh, uh, resilience goal and, 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 and how do we keep uh, the societal functions. And, and then the last point, if I may, I, I, I think I, I refer to it quickly uh, uh, in the presentation or in our analysis of risks. Uh, uh, what we see in terms of, of, of gaps is, is, is precisely to integrate uh, the climate dimension in all the work that's being done. And, you know, it's easy for us to tell our member states, look, it's not enough to know your risk today. You've got to do more in order to project and see, you know, what's the climate uh, uh, projections, etc. I think they know that they have to do it, that, you know, but at the same time, sometimes they just say, yeah, but, you know, how, how can we get support to do that or how we do it? So perhaps here, this is uh, something where we can collectively look at solutions. I mean, uh, how we integrate actually climate in all these sorts of analysis and policies. Thank uh, you. Can, yeah, over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Philippe, finally to you, uh, to close us off, uh, again, the same reflection on either or both of the two questions, uh, how research and innovation, which I'm sure you'll have a, 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 a view on uh, from your directorate, it can support policy and adaptation on decision making. Uh, and then again, where you feel the knowledge needs and gaps are that are most important to support the new European policies that we're hearing about. Okay, those are very vast questions. I'll try are to be are? short also because we are already behind schedule. But clearly, I mean, I, I think that the, the whole core of the presentation I gave is a response to the first question, uh, what, what research innovation uh, should do to support policies and to try to test and to show which are the best solutions and, and also to reduce the cost of the deployment of the, the solutions. This can be done through uh, large scale demonstrators and this is what we try to do t through the missions, uh, but not only through the missions. In terms of uh, uh, gaps, uh, this, these will. Uh, we have a whole program, Horizon Europe, with other components than the mission. The mission is only a small bit uh, of it, and and the development of knowledge, the research innovation on the gaps, will take place in the different clusters uh, of uh, Horizon Europe, but also in the more uh, blue sky research in the European Research Council. It can happen anywhere in the in the Horizon Europe program, also in the EIC, European Innovation Council, for really applied activities. Uh, and and uh, I, I think that the, the, the main gap is, is not specifically on one uh, issue. Is the, the, the greatest difficulty is to gather the information that comes from several sources to make it understandable and accessible to those who will need it and in a fully transparent way. Uh, and this is a huge challenge. You may say, yes, this is not a research innovation gap. Uh, maybe not, but actually we may find that it is one because what's the purpose uh, of gathering all this knowledge if this knowledge is not transferred to those who need it? Um, uh, I, I strongly believe that even academics now have understood that uh, they cannot pursue only the academic goal, uh, which is uh, publishing uh, as much as possible, but they have to go beyond. Because now this is a major societal challenge. We need to transform society and research innovation is absolutely fundamental, is instrumental to transform society. So this obliges us, citizens, researchers, policymakers, to go a bit beyond or usual uh, definition of our job descriptions and, and, and bring therefore these uh, the best knowledge available to those who can test it and deploy it so that we will increase the resilience in Europe uh, wherever possible. Um, thank you and that was almost the perfect way of ending by saying that we have um, finished this session and I would like to thank all of our speakers enormously for their contributions, uh, Elena, Nasira and Philippe. That really was very informative and it set us up perfectly for the next uh, two days. 
I'd like to uh, encourage our invited experts, but also um, other people who are on the plenary session to join the sessions. There's a lot of really fantastic material available, uh, of online training with talks over the next two days. And maybe to, to end, I'll just take on board um, Philippe's point and say, what we probably need to do over the next two days is go into this with a spirit of going a bit beyond where we've been before. And, and it is clear that we're at a really critical new area and a new point in time where we do need to move uh, away and take what we've learned and what we are still learning and move that into practice uh, to deal with the challenges of uh, climate change and to scale up and deliver climate adaptation, both in terms of that process that I talked about, but also the modeling work to support that. So on that, I will say thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to the organizers. I think that just about worked, um, which is great and gives us some confidence for the next two days. And I would like to end by uh, uh, saying that the presentations will be available and so will the um, proceedings. So please look out for those uh, and look forward to um, talking to many of you again over the next uh, two days. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I'll um, end the seminar. Uh, thank you. <laughs>